Chan. I'm uh, in IAMS Institute of Atomic and Molecular Sciences. And today it's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kenpin Lo, Lo uh, Jianping, from Singapore. Uh, Kenpin got his degree from NUS National University of Singapore, and then he went to Oxford for his PhD. After that, he also went to Japan, Niren, uh, for diamond research. Uh, after that, he went back to NUS as an assistant professor, associate professor, and currently he is the head of chemistry department. And he, he is also the uh, initiator for the graphene center in Singapore. Now he's uh, doing a, a marvelous job in uh, on graphene. So, Kempin uh, came to Taiwan to attend uh, the workshop, uh, the carbon-related uh, workshop, mainly on graphene, in Hualien. And he, uh, we took, we take this opportunity to invite him to come give such a colloquial talk. Uh, last night, we in Hualien, we met with Zhen Jialian. So, uh, Zhen Jialian is a Hakka, Ke Jialian, from South Africa. And uh, Kenpin is a Hakka from Singapore, and I'm a Hakka from Taiwan. <laughs> so you can tell the fusion of the food, uh, particularly those chemists are very good in, in tasting and, and cooking. So well, with that, uh, I will save most of the time to Kenpin. Great. And welcome. Can you hear me at the back? for the introduction. And as is mentioned, I'm uh, Ke Jialen. <laughs> I think uh, Yan Yuan Liu Chang. <laughs> good tradition, culture, food, and that's how we identify one another many years ago in Singapore when we attended a conference in Singapore. I was then a young assistant professor, just came back to Singapore from overseas, starting my career. And I had a conversation with Chris Shen, and then he mentioned his uh, Hakka. And soon enough, we struck a good friendship and we should maintain until today. So today I'm very happy to come here to share with you some of the recent results we have in graphene research. Um, I'm one of the members in the graphene research center in Singapore. There are many members in this research center, I'm just one of them. Uh, but I represent the perspective of the chemist in graphene. Now graphene is an area dominated by the physicists because of the many interesting properties of this material first discovered by the physicists. But the chemists believe they may have the final say in this material. Uh, second to come in, but maybe first to come out, I don't know. Because we believe a lot of the high-end physics application, they are too fanciful, they may not be able to realize in the next 10 years, maybe even next 20 years. But the low-end, Nonetheless, highly useful applications in graphene may emerge in the chemical industry first. Okay, so if I have time, I will show you some of the interesting catalytic applications in graphene that's related to the defects. Okay? So the physicists are very interested in perfect material, perfect crystals, pristine semiconductors, but even for the defects and the strange structure in graphene, we can find some interesting properties. So, I'm going to share with you this today. Um, I see that most of you are graduate students. You may not be familiar with graphene, so I give a brief introduction. Basically, it is an atomic sheet of carbon, where the carbon has uh, sp2 hybridization. This is an aromatic framework. When it's pristine, it's supposed to be like this. You have that. You have this aromatic framework extending infinitely. Now, uh, but the actual fact is never like this. There will be grain boundaries and defects. There are some stone wheel defects, uh, five, seven, five and seven membered ring. Uh, this kind of graphene can be grown by chemical vapor deposition today. If you have a copper foil, uh, you decompose the carbon on copper foil. There's a self-limiting process to form just a very thin sheet of atomic carbon, which is graphene. So if you etch away the copper, you can recover this graphene by solution transfer process. 
is a pioneering work by Rodney Rowe and Gary Hong. And the chemist worked with another type of graphene called the graphene oxide from graphite. If you subject graphite to oxidation, you transform it to graphite oxide. And due to the steric constraint imposed by the negatively charged oxygen group, you can disperse this material if you apply a sonication, ultrasonic wave. And then you can uncover uh, graphene oxide, which can be dispersed in solution, because the oxygen functional group impart on this material solubility. Okay, so it's hydrophilic. Now, the chemist can perform interesting chemistry with this material because of the presence of the oxygen functional group, allow it to undergo uh, chemical bonding, ionic interaction, as well as non-ionic interaction. The reason why it can be solubilized in water is because of the hydrogen bonding, and this gives this ability to undergo secondary uh, assembly to form hierarchical structures, to form porous framework, and so on. So to the chemist, this kind of graphene represents a giant polyaromatic framework that can mediate multiple interactions. A consequence of graphene being a soft membrane, because it's very soft, like a plastic sheet, you know, a plastic sheet is easily wrinkled, easily rippled. So the consequence of graphene being a soft membrane is that it can be strained, engineered. If you apply strain on the material, you can generate Rippers, bubbles. I'm going to show you that these bubbles, are just like the bubbles in the bubble wrap, is very interesting. We can perform a lot of interesting physics and chemistry with these strange structures. As a soft membrane, graphene is easily rippled, meaning you can form rippers easily on the graphene. Now, if you grow the graphene on uh, copper catalyst, because the copper surface has a lot of steps, you see, the step structure, step bond, it's never totally flat. So when the graphene grow on this, because it's a soft membrane going on a other substrate, it inherit some of these features on the copper. So when you transfer the graphene, normally it's transferred by putting a polymer stem transfer onto an any arbitrary substrate. You find that the graphene will inherit this ripple, which means that it is not flat. Most of the time, the ideal picture discussed by physics is graphene being flat. Actually, it is usually not flat, especially when you transfer it using the stem transfer. You find that there are ripples. Now, these ripples have implication on the charge mobility of the graphene. The uh, electron phonon scattering in graphene is believed to be very weak because graphene has very high phonon frequency. However, when you have graphene which is bent out of plane, like when you form ripples like this, it is bent out of plane, then this out of plane vibration comes into uh, play, and then there's another uh, phonon branch, we call the flexural phonon branch. The flexural phonon branch comes into play and that will limit the mobility of the electrons. Now this flexural phonon branch, the dispersion is usually quadratic. But if you apply strain on the structure, you can change the dispersion into linear. So if you apply strain texture, you can actually suppress this uh, flexural phonon scattering. Now this gives us some clue that strain engineering may be quite important in this kind of material. I will show you how we can form periodically strained uh, pattern on a graphene sheet which is supposedly uh, flat. And if you generate periodically strained structures, now this graphene is transformed into a reaction red ball. Now this, you know, when you do an uh, optical experiment, you have the optical red ball. This optical red ball has holes. So the same, for this graphene, you can transform it to a reaction red ball. Uh, if you use, if you blow the graphene on a metal, for example, uh, ruthenium. Ruthenium is a uh, transition uh, metal, and uh, it's half filled, you know, B7 transition metal, and this has strong interaction with carbon, you know. And because of this uh, strong bonding between ruthenium and carbon, uh, there is this uh, buckling instability arising from the compressive stress. You know, there's a lattice mismatch, and this buckling instability causes the graphene to undergo corrugation. It forms ripples. Like this, it's like a series of humps and valleys. You know, it looks like a blistering blisters. The graphene is not flat, consisting of periodic blisters when it's grown on a metal such as ruthenium. Uh, what is interesting is that you have hump region when the graphene is lifted off from the metal substrate. So this is like freestanding graphene, and then you have regions where the graphene is attached to the metal substrate. This undergoes strong hybridization with the metal. So this looks like a bubble wrap. You know, it gives us a clue. So one inspiration when we look at these periodic blisters is that this resembles the bubble wrap. Now what happens if you pierce these bubbles? Will you be able to uh, relieve the elastic strain and form a bigger bubble? You know, is 
there any way to control the string? So this is one of the questions uh, that we ask. Now, if you subject this periodic blistering structure, to be, uh, in certain signs, we call this the Moray superstructure because it has a bigger periodicity. There's a big periodicity of three nanometer compared to the intrinsic uh, graphene periodicity arising from this Moray superstructure. Uh, if you subject this structure to hydrogenation, for example, because I'm a chemist, I like to do reaction. If you dose atomic hydrogen from a plasma source onto such a structure, then the question is, will there be any preferential reaction between hydrogen and this landscape? What's interesting is that the hydrogen land on this landscape, initially it is random, but you heat it up to about 300 degrees Celsius, you find that hydrogen start diffusing. And where does hydrogen go? It's actually moved to the hump, you know, to the peak. It goes from the valley and it goes to the hump. It forms a ring. Hydrogen decorates this to form a ring. The reason is that when hydrogen bonds to the graphene, it changes from the sp2 hybridization to sp3. And you cannot have a single hydrogen bonding because uh, the other carbon atoms are wrangling bonds. So you have to alternate one hydrogen is up and one hydrogen is down to balance. It's a countersink to balance this bonding. And it is easier to have the counterbalance bonding on the hump region because the hump region is lifted from the substrate. And this region is uh, reacting strongly with the rotating substrate. So the hydrogen go all the way to the hump. So in this way, it is possible to form a periodic hydrogenated structure on this landscape. So this is a unique reaction uh, breadboard. Another illustration of this unique reaction breadboard is that you can use fullerene, for example. Fullerene is, you see there's no, uh, in a chemist, we say there's no ligands. It doesn't undergo directional bonding because it's isotropic, just like a sphere, just like a ping pong ball. Now, if you put this sphere on the on this landscape, where would it go? You know, if you put this uh, fullerene on this landscape, where do you think it will bond? Would it go to the valley? Would it go to the hump? Now, this, because of the hump and valley region, it has different potential energy. This landscape has different potential energy. Normally, on graphite surface, which is flat, the C60 will just diffuse very easily because there's no difference in the uh, uh, potential, potential energy across the landscape. But here, it is different. We discovered that the C60 occupy different sites. One site they occupy in the valley region, this is uh, the, actually the hexagonal cross-packed region of this graphene structure. The C60 molecules are frozen. Even at room temperature, it does not rotate. So we can see this uh, dumbbell shape which originates from these two five-membered rings. You know, this is a scanning tunneling uh, microscopy image. You can see that this. And then once it occupies this structure, the next C60 molecule will then arrange around it. It forms uh, six C60 molecules. And then the next C60 molecule will then occupy the top of this, the hump. So it's, so it's a hierarchical assembly. It occupies the lowest energy site, and then to the next high energy, and to the next high energy. You know? And this C60, which is on the, on the hump, they can rotate. So the resolution is, because it's moving, it's turning, rotating. We cannot resolve it. But the C60, which is in the valley region, because of the very strong cohesive interaction among all the C60 surrounding it, it is locked and it's frozen, even at room temperature, it does not rotate. So it can be resolved. And it's all aligned in one direction. You can see all the C60 is pointing in one direction, molecularly aligned in one direction. And this is the energy level diagram showing you what happened. The C60 molecule first occupy a particular site. We call the hexagonal close back site. And then the next, it goes to the face center cubic site on this Morris structure, then it goes to the hump, so on and so forth. And finally, because all the C60 molecules are assembled at high coverage, they have a cohesive on the wall interaction, and uh, they become highly stable. At, the, at this HCP site, at the valley region, the C60 is frozen, you know, it's not rotating. Now, this suggests that you can use this Morris reaction template to order molecules and to cause them to align in one direction, even at room temperature. Normally, the molecules are highly mobile. On any surface, they will just diffuse and move around. It's very difficult to get them to align directionally at room temperature. So the next question is this. Can we engineer the strain in graphene by forming bubbles? Because we see these periodic blisters resemble a bubble wrap. So I want to do some engineering to form the bubbles. The reason is this. Because graphene has no band gap, it's a sem semi-metal, so it's quite useless in digital electronics. So we want to engineer a bank gap. One strategy is to apply strain on graphene. We can couple the Dirac electrons in graphene to strain our pseudo-magnetic field, creating electrodynamic that is dependent solely on the uh, geometry of the honeycomb lattice. 
Now this pseudo-magnetic field can be a few hundred of Tesla, which is impossible to apply in a laboratory setting using a steady state magnetic, magnetic field. But you, if you can create this strain locally of an appropriate strain texture, then you can induce the pseudo-magnetic field. Once you induce a pseudo-magnetic field, you can split. The electrons are caused to go in a very small circle. Then energy level will be segregated into well-defined lambda energy levels, and then you can open up a bank gap in between, which is actually a semi-metal. Now the problem is this, how can we control such strain at the nano scale? It's not easy to control the strain. If you just generate any arbitrary strain texture, you will not induce this high in pseudo magnetic field. So you could do it with a very precise geometry on the Morris super lattice. And the strategy is this, when we look at the Morris super lattice, it has the hump and the valley and the hump and the valley. So the, the strategy applied by the chemist is this. We can flow molecular oxygen so that oxygen intercalate between the graphene and the metal substrate. Once the metal bonds the oxygen to form oxide, the graphene will then be released from the bonding. So once you release the bonding, it releases elastic strain. In this case, you can convolute the blisters to form a bigger bubble. So like three of these blisters can be convoluted to form a triangular bubble. And you, if you heat the bubble to very high temperature, it will burst. Then you leave behind a hole. The hole in physics is an anti dot. So there's a strategy to form anti dot structures, which has very interesting uh, physics phenomenon as well. And if you convolute uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if you convolute, if you center seven of these blisters, they may form, they may grow, and then form a big hexagonal uh, bubble. And this is a very precise geometry because it follows uh, this. Uh, geometry of the Morris palatis, which has a hexagonal uh, pattern, a C3, C6 sort of a pattern. So the way we ask, okay, if we look at the Morris superstructures, how can we engineer it precisely? If you look at the Morris superstructure using STM, you find that, uh, okay, these are all the Morris superstructure. You see that you recognize the hexagonal structure. The bright spot represents the hump, and the darkest spot represents the valley. There are some regions which is irregular. It does not have a regular pattern in some regions. The question is why? Why some region has no uh, regularity? Then it occurred to us that this is due to the fact that the metal is not perfect. If you have soft surface defects in the metal, you cannot form a nice Morris superstructure. This means this. If you induce defects in the metal, subsurface defects, you actually unpin the bonding between the graphene and the metal. So the Morris superstructure did not develop. And this region it will be easiest to delaminate the graphene to form the bubble. Now, if this is true, we can use iron beam to actually engineer subsurface effects on the metal, then grow the graphene over. In this case, once you generate lots of defects, later on when you introduce oxygen, all these defective regions become a bubble in shape. The bubbles are in shape. So doing this in a precise manner allow us to control the density of the bubble. As I've shown you. Three of these blisters, when they join together, they form a, under the STM, we can see a triangular bubble. And then if you have five of these, it forms like a trapezium. If you have seven of these, it forms a very nice uh, hexagonal bubble. Okay, so the graphene moray blisters can be transformed into geometric nanobubbles. What's interesting about these bubbles is that when you perform scanning, tunneling spectroscopy, this is a technique that allows you to probe the local density of state you find that there's a series of peaks, which normally does not appear if the graphene is just a flat graphene. Now these peaks are believed to be related to the Landau energy level induced by the pseudo-magnetic field. From these peaks, we can actually calculate <coughs> the energy of the level, which has a field index, as well as uh, you can extract the pseudo-magnetic field. We find that it's as large as 650 Tesla, which is impossible to obtain in a normal laboratory physics laboratory, you cannot have this any steady state field, you can't reach this. But for such a very strain, the nanobubble is so small, no nanometer scale length, you strain it, it has very high pseudomagnetic field, and then you can induce electronic gap of about 0.8 mm, so you open up a bank gap in this uh, graphene. If you look very carefully at one of these hexagonal bubble, and then you look at the strain, the strain can be looked at by measuring the carbon-carbon lattice, relative to the unstrained common common lattice, strain versus unstrained, then you get this uh, strain. And then you go across the length, you find that uh, the strain is of course highest 
at the edge of the bubble, when you bend this way, here has the most strain, and then when the bubble goes up, the flat region has the least strain. So if you do a scanning tunneling stereoscopy across this length, you will find that the energy of the nano energy level peak is shifted to higher energy at the edge, whereas if it's at the uh, center region, it's towards lower energy. Now this tells us that the pseudo magnetic field that is induced is directly correlated to the strain. The higher the strain, the larger the pseudo magnetic field, the more you can open up the gap. So even in this strain structure, the strain is not just the same. It's non-uniform, depends on the geometry of the bubble, which follows the hexagon shape. So besides this interesting physics, which tell us that by engineering strain, you can change the transport properties in the graphene. Another interesting uh, feature we'd like to know is how about the chemistry inside the graphene nanobubbles? Now we look at the strain, but how about inside? What is inside the bubbles? For chemists, this is an interesting problem. It's, it's not, the bubble is not vacant inside. It contains something. Okay, what, what is it inside? It, it has, it, it's possible to encapsulate liquid inside, apparently. And it's a very interesting concept. If you can encapsulate water molecule like this, we remember that graphene is impermeable. It's very difficult to pass any gas molecule, impossible to pass water molecules through the graphene because if there's no defect, no hole, these rings are very small. You, you cannot get through. So this is an impermeable membrane. So you can seal the water molecule within the bubble, and then you provide an opportunity to observe high pressure, high temperature chemistry, just like an NDU cell. Well, normally, if you want to perform high pressure, high temperature, chemistry, you have used a diamond and new cell. But now we can use a graphene membrane. And the way we do it is to form the bubbles, high density of bubbles, by putting the graphene on diamond. My old research field is diamond, so it's natural for me to marry graphene and diamond. What happens when you marry graphene and diamond? Will they uh, be ha uh, happily married? <laughs> no, the, the diamond, the bonding is sp3 hybridized. The graphene is sp2, right? They're not matched. But at the surface of diamond, in order to maintain the sp3 integrity, diamond is usually truncated by atomic hydrogen. Now, if you heat the diamond up to high temperature in vacuum, the hydrogen will dissolve, and then you generate dangling bond. So you put a graphene on hydrogenated diamond, and you heat it up, at the instant where hydrogen dissolves, dangling bond is generated, and then you are bond to the graphene. And because of the lattice mismatch, they are totally lattice mismatch, once they undergo covalent bonding, it will induce, again, the rippling. Ripples will form. It just happens that the way the graphene is transferred onto diamond, normally we etch the copper, we grow the graphene on copper foil, and then we put it in the etching bath to etch away the copper. And because of surface tension at the air-water interface, creases will be formed on the graphene, creases and ripples. Now these creases and ripples, because of capillary action, will draw in some fluid, right? And then when you transfer the graphene onto diamond, the fluid is trapped, you see, it's trapped within. Once you heat it up, you rearrange itself, and it gets trapped. So this is the graphene transferred onto diamond. It form, before it forms the bubbles, you can see the ripples. These are ripples. We believe some water may be trapped by capillary uh, forces inside. And once you heat it up, straight away the landscape transforms. It forms many, 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 many small bubbles. And liquid is actually entrapped within the bubble. Okay? I call this the hydrothermal end view. We call graphene nanobubbles on diamond. If you perform a Raman stereoscopy, if you just put a piece of graphene on diamond, before you heat it up, just pristine, flat graphene. From Raman stereoscopy, it's very sensitive to the uh, phonon frequency. Any strain that's applied on the, on the material will change that, and then you can track the way it shifts. For pristine graphene on diamond, you see the normal uh, G mode, and the, as well as the 2D mode, and then you have a small B band, which is related to the defects. Now, the moment you heat up this graphene on diamond so that you form the bubbles, graphene nanobubbles on diamond, you find that there's a weight shift. The, the Raman peak starts to move towards the red region, which is consistent with a biaxial strain applied to the material. And the defects peak become bigger. No. No, we use C13 to grow the graphene. The reason that we want to uncouple the diamond phonon, the diamond has a phonon peak at 1300, we uncouple it, we can see clearly the C13 mode that came to the graphene. And this is the defect peak. The defect peak becomes bigger because now the sp2 graphene has to undergo rehybridization, some part of it to bond to the diamond, become sp3 hybridized, you have a bigger defect peak. At the same time, a new peak developed. Uh, this new peak is very interesting. It's at 1150 wave number. 
It's a mixed SP2, SP3 assigned to the trans polyacetylene. So the structure of the graphene and dimer interface has been changed. The carbon bonding has rearranged. Okay? Uh, what is interesting chemically is this. Normally the flat graphene, if graphene is flat, it has very high in-plane conductivity. It's anisotropic, the electrons move this way very fast, very good. But out of plane conductivity is very poor. Because basically the SP2 two-dimensional framework is anisotropic. Out of plane charge transfer is very poor. Now once you bend the structure to form a bubble, now you bend the P orbital out of plane. So intuitively, now you get some kind of uh, electron density which is on the concave side. Now flat graphene electron density distribution is same on both sides. But once you bend it, there's more electron density on the outside compared to the inside. Inside is less reactive now. Outside is more reactive, right? Electron density is on the outside. And you, you can prove this by performing a cyclic voltammetry. This is a classic technique used in the electrical chemistry where you cycle a potential and then you monitor the charge transfer to a redox couple in the solution. The, the diamond that we use, we dope it so that it becomes a, a conducting diamond. It shows now from here to here, the separation tells you something about the current density. Now once you put a graphene on diamond, you find that the current density has dropped compared to the black line, which is just plain diamond. Now it's a, the red line, it shows the decrease in current density, which is expected because flat graphene is charge transfer out of plane is very sluggish. But once you heat it up to form the nano bubbles, straight away the current increase a lot. So this tells us that the electrochemical activity, flat graphene has no electrochemical activity out of plane. Once you bend it to form the bubble, it becomes highly electrochemically active. What's most interesting is this. What happened to the water molecules that is trapped here inside the bubble? So that's the question. Now, if it's a very good opportunity to observe the hydrogen bonding in this internal cavity because graphene is transparent, diamond is also transparent. This means you can perform optical spectroscopy in situ. This is like an optical cell, a very good optical cell where the liquid is sealed inside for observation. You can keep this optical cell to high temperature and the liquid cannot evaporate. Normally you hit water, 100 degrees Celsius evaporate. Now you imagine you seal water inside this membrane, hit it up to 800 degrees Celsius and it still does not evaporate. Well, what happened to the water at this stage? Is it a gas, is it a, is it a uh, you know, or is it a liquid? It's neither a gas nor liquid, it has transformed to the supercritical phase. And this supercritical phase water has very interesting properties. That surprises us. I will show you later. But we perform Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy because uh, this is a vibrational spectroscopy that can track the OH oscillator, you know, hydroxy oscillator. This is very sensitive to the intermolecular hydrogen bonding. Water molecule has OH. Another water molecule has OH. They undergo this hydrogen bonding. Each time you undergo intermolecular hydrogen bonding, you cause a weight shift. You cause a weakening of the OH oscillator. So there's a red shift in the OH peak that you can track when you perform infrared spectroscopy. Now this is a diamond. First we have the diamond control sample. The diamond shows the 3 phonon peak and it has this peak here at 3600 weight number which corresponds to the free water molecule. Now this is room temperature, there's lots of water coming, you know. But once you heat up the diamond just a little bit, just a, a bit hot, this water peak disappears immediately, which is expected. Now once you put a graphene on diamond, yeah, you still see this water peak, but once you heat it up and transform the graphene to graphene nanobubble, now this water peak did not disappear. Not only does it not disappear, you find that new peaks start to evolve at the lower wave number, there's a weight shift. All these new peaks tell us that the water molecules is undergoing increased hydrogen bonding, increased clustering. So once we, we heat it up to higher and higher temperature, the water did not boil, it. so it undergoes increased clustering. At some point, there's a reverse shift, new peaks start to appear, telling us that first increase hydrogen bonding, then reduce hydrogen bonding. The reduced hydrogen bonding stage, where we see some new peaks arising, is about 673 Kelvin, which is near the critical temperature for water. It undergo a supercritical phase transition. Now, this process is dynamic. If you cool down, you stop heating, immediately all these features uh, disappear and it goes back to before. See, so the water molecules. So this hydrogen bonding is dynamic. Now once the water is transformed by supercritical phase, it becomes highly corrosive. At a supercritical condition, the water molecule, the bonding is changed. Normally water is thought of as a sort of a ionic hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole bonding. Once at a